Hello and welcome to the discussion. This channel is here to serve as a platform for scholarly discussions about some of the most significant questions regarding the historical Jesus, early Christian history, the philosophy of religion, and thoughtful theology. My name is Nahoa, and I'm here to ask those questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. Right now, we're continuing to focus on early Christian history. Of course, the Jesus movement did not die with its leader. Rather, there arose a belief that although Christ was killed, he was also exalted. A number of people ca came to proclaim that God raised Jesus from the dead. But what did that mean to various people in the ancient world, and what does resurrection mean for us today? Should we act on it as a metaphorical vindication of Jesus' message, or as a literal revivification of Jesus' corpse? How do Western Christians differ from Eastern Christians in our beliefs about all this? These are some of the questions we'll get into. The scholar joining and teaching us today earned his Doctor of Divinity from St. Patrick's College in Maynooth, Ireland, and he was a Catholic priest for about a decade and a Catholic monk for about two decades. Now he's Emeritus Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University in Chicago. His reconstruction of the historical Jesus centers around Jesus as a Mediterranean Jewish peasant who preached and practiced his vision of God's rule as immediately and universally accessible. He rebuked social norms, expressed the rule of the Father as a present, unbrokered reality, and modeled nonviolent resistance of injustice. That injustice includes when he was killed on the cross. Now, to affirm that he was raised from the dead means we choose to follow his way of peace and participate with him in making the world a more just place. At least, that's my attempt to summarize key elements of a lifetime of my guest perspective. Anyways, I have been absolutely intrigued and challenged preparing for this interview. So, without further introduction, Dr. John Dominic Crossan, how are you? And thank you, Neho, for having me and for that very good summary. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you're such a prominent figure in historical Jesus studies and New Testament studies. I'm genuinely honored to have you on. Um, we're going to talk about the meaning of resurrection, you know, like I said, differing traditions within Christendom, prophecy historicized in the Gospels if we have time. But first, we're going to start with something a little different. Usually, I ask my guests personal questions at the end, but you suggested okay. that it would be important to, uh, to ask them up front to understand your life. So we can do that right now. All right. Let me say two things about me that are important to understand. And sure. these I had nothing to, do, nothing to do with. They were done to me, so that I'm not claiming any merit. I grew up in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, where Roman Catholicism was like the wallpaper of the country. You know, nobody said, no, you have to believe this. You have to, this is literal. You could do the Stations of the Cross, and you learned that Jesus, um, uh, Veronica wiped the face of Jesus, and nobody said, now, Pilate really did condemn Jesus, but Veronica, that's kind of legend. Nobody did that. So I was able to kind of experience this, first of all, in a country that wasn't, how am I put it, Dispu disputing about literalism. It just wasn't there. I mean, it, it wasn't my virtue or anything else. <laughs> the Republic of Ireland, being Irish and being Catholic was the same thing, honestly. They hardly differentiated between it, politics and religion. Okay, the second thing is this. Because the small countries, small towns of Ireland couldn't afford to have a decent high school, if you're going to high school at all, by the way, you had to go to a boarding school, unless you lived in Dublin or one of the, the few big cities. We were living in the wilds of Donegal in a place called Bally Buffet, end of the earth. So I had to go to a boarding school. The boarding school still retained the old British education system that had been established to teach them how to run an empire. Five years of Greek, five years of Latin, every day. So before I ever got to the Bible or any of this stuff, I was reading you know, Virgil in Latin, the Aeneid in Greek, and nobody was telling me, you know, you have to believe, don't believe that this God did that. And you, nobody did that. I was able to absorb these stories, kind of make up my own mind, you know, like a kid would who's up to his eyes and the clensions and conjugations and all that stuff. What do I think about Venus? I, I, so by the time, I'm serious, by the time I got to read the Old Testament and the New Testament, I was kind of inoculated against literalism. 
not against taking it seriously, really not. <laughs> but it didn't come in until I came to this country and really began, really after I was educated and everything else and had my doctorate and came back, participated in the Jesus Seminar, began to realize there's all sorts of people who take this all literally. Not just seriously, which I, I did too, believe me, but literally, and I discriminate. And I know how to discriminate because I, I learned how to do it with Virgil and Homer, the Old Testament, the, the New Testament of Roman imperial theology. So I didn't start off fighting <laughs> literalism. And that's why my whole drive has not been really to fight literalism, but to do good history. Mm. That's what I'm interested in. That doesn't mean I do it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that intending to do it with garden theater. Of course not. But basically, I'm not getting my I'm not getting my position in opposition to theirs. I really am it. I do it if somebody asks me. What do I think about? Do I think this happened? Do I think that? Of course, but that, uh, that's important simply to know in order to assess my position. That's all. Doesn't prove anything. It's just the way, <laughs> the, the look of the draw, the way I was born, where I lived and what happened to me. Now you have <laughs> all of your books behind you um, and you've been publishing for basically half a century. So this question about what you've changed your mind on throughout these years, whether from uh, personal conversations and experiences or from your studies, uh, just what's something significant you've changed your mind on? And I'm especially excited to ask this question to you. Oh, well, let me take the, the example that we will be talking a lot about resurrection. I don't think I realized seriously enough the distinction between ascension and resurrection. That is apotheosis, to use the Greek terms, apotheosis and anastasis. I simply, and secondly, I don't think, well, I don't think, I didn't recognize that when we were talking about resurrection in the Western world, we were only talking about the Western world. It was that blindness that we all have, that there's a whole other Christianity, let's call it Eastern Christianity, which in this case, not in every case, crucifixion looks pretty much the same in both places, and so does nativity, is radically different. I'm really saying this, profoundly different. And I learned that, you know, in the way I learned a lot of things, practically, I was taking I was part of the four people, uh, Marianne and Marcus Borg, Sarah and myself, who were leading 40 people in the first 20, well, in the first 15 years of, of this century in search of Paul around Turkey. And by accident, really, we ended up, of course, in a lot of Eastern Orthodox churches. You, you can't bypass Goreme, you can't bypass Cappadocia simply to get from one place to the other. So of course we were beginning to see the Eastern vision of resurrection. We were literally seeing it and beginning to realize it's not just this place, this is the way it is everywhere in Eastern Christianity. And then of course, every night on these um, pilgrimages we were taking people, Marcus and I gave a half hour lecture every night and I tried to correlate what we were seeing during the day, about Paul mostly, with what we were talking about at night. And so if we'd spent the day, say, at Cappadocia, looking at <laughs> images of the Eastern resurrection, I had to kind of face, how do I do 1 Corinthians 15 tonight? Mm. What are we imagining? So like so much of my life, honestly, rightly or wrongly, it was forced upon me by circumstances. It wasn't that I had a magnificent revelation. Oh, we should really talk about Eastern <laughs> resurrection. And when Tom Wright writes his huge big book about resurrection, he never even mentions it. Well, if I'd written a huge big book about it at that time, neither would I. <laughs> so, okay, I learned the hard way by seeing it and realizing it was everywhere all over Eastern Christianity. And then we went looking for it, of course. And before we were writing the book, we, we didn't just 
run into. We went looking for it all the way from, I'm going to say Spain to Syria. We managed to get to the Syria in 2010, probably the last time you could do it without a flight jacket and Moscow all the way to Egypt. So we began to see this is a totally different vision of, let me, let me put it this way neutrally, of Easter. I'm using that as a neutral term for the moment than the West, and we have to recognize it and discuss it. Now, you and your wife have written a beautiful book called Resurrecting Easter, and, and where you talk about this, the differences between Eastern, uh, Eastern Orthodox depictions in artwork and iconography of the resurrection or of the Easter event for neutrality, and how that uh, compares or and contrasts with Western depictions of a more individual Easter event. So let's talk about that. You, you, you. T- the subtitle is basically how the East preserved and the West lost the original vision of Easter. So, so tell us more about how you think Eastern Orthodox Christianity understood and preserved that original communal meaning of, of resurrection or anastasis, and how the West kind of lost that. Okay, and I back up a little bit to the the writing of the book. Originally, when we were doing this, this would be the years uh, 2000 to 2015, we were going every year to Turkey. And since our way was paid (laughs) to the pilgrims, that we spent a week before, a week afterwards, exploring all of this stuff. I was really focusing, to be honest, on on the Eastern stuff. But then very often when I lectured on it before the book was written, people would say, yeah, 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 yeah. What about the Western stuff? Give us some history of it. So when I wrote the book, by that time, I figured I, I can't just talk about the East. I'm going to talk about the West and the East. And the subtext is going to be something like this. I think this is not just an exercise in art history, comparative art history, or that I'm going into art history instead of biblical studies. I think that the West has lost something by going individual, by that I mean Jesus coming out of the tomb, totally alone, all by himself, magnificent, powerful, triumphant, nobody there. Thank you for that image. You can see the soldiers are down below, kind of either looking up and seeing it, or because in Matthew's gospel, they kind of lie about it. The position is they saw it and they lie and said, well, we were asleep, somebody must have stolen the body. So they're seeing it and Jesus is ascending. And I think you can see the women in the distance are coming to the tomb as it were, too late. So this is the ascension. And anyone in the Greco-Roman world, I should emphasize this, not just the Jews or the Messianic uh, Christics, anyone in the Roman world who looked at that would probably see, yeah, this is an apotheosis. I think this guy, whoever he is, is ascending up to the gods, must be a very famous person. Um, And yeah, he's kind of not dressed fully, so that's what I tip, he's been divinized as it were, all of that makes sense. So anyone in the Western Western world of the first century, Greeks, Jews, Romans would say, this is an apotheosis. All right, so that's one option. Now it's possible, I think, Nahoa, for somebody to argue that could happen. I mean, the whole first century world believed it could happen. (laughs) They really did. So in the middle of the second century, when Justin Martyr is arguing, arguing in favor of Christianity, of course, he challenges the Romans by saying, well, look, you guys believe that people can ascend into heaven, ascend notices his word, You claim it for all of these people, mostly male, by the way, he only mentions one woman. And even your emperors, you claim your emperors ascend into heaven. How come you pick on us poor guys who we say Jesus did? It's a heck of an argument, by the way. It really is a good argument. They can't come back and say, well, that's not possible. We just don't believe. They can come back and did, get this in Chelsea's, saying, "Your, your Jesus isn't worthy of ascending into heaven. But they don't debate the possibility. And neither, of course, could Justin claim uniqueness. He is ready to do what Paul did. Okay, Augustus is up in heaven. Jesus is up in heaven. Who's doing more for you? 
Now, there is a real good, honest to God, first century debate. Who's doing more for you, the emperor up in heaven or Jesus? So if you think of ascension, that would sort of be the obvious thing to claim. And my suspicion is actually that the earliest interpretation, watch my language, interpretation of Easter, using neutral language again, or what happened was ascension, that Jesus had ascended into heaven. We, we'll get back maybe for the arguments for that. Now, let me turn to another interpretation, another interpretation of what happened. This is what we call resurrection. The Greek term is anastasis. Thank you very much for showing it. You can see the Greek written up above that, as usual in all of these images, and this is a modern image, saying, hey, anastasis, in Greek capital letters, Greek angels, the resurrection. So there's no doubt this is what it is. This is the resurrection. It's not Jesus just <laughs> holding hands with people. Now, if you look at that image, and it's a typical image, it's probably a modern one, but the ancient ones are, look much the same. Jesus is resurrecting. He has a cruciform halo, as you can see. I don't, I can't see, I don't think he has the wounds visible in this one, but many, many of them they are, the wounds are his hands and feet. He's standing on the bifold gates of Hades. Hades, not hell. Hades, the place of the dead. Again, cruciform. He's giving a left hand to Eve and a right hand to Adam. And that one, the two-handed sort of equal opportunity resurrection doesn't appear much before, say, 1250. Before that, Jesus tends to be focusing mostly on Adam and poor Eve is waiting her turn, as it were. In the background, you can see to our left, John the Baptist, you always kind of know him because he needs a shave and a haircut. And although this has been cropped, I think, the two figures immediately to our left, viewer left of John the Baptist would be David and Solomon. David would be uh, crowned and bearded, Solomon crowned and unbearded. They're certainly there, though it's been cropped badly. Um, let me see, over on the other side is uh, the first martyr of the Old Testament, Abel. You can see he's got his uh, staff. The other character, I'm not certain who it is. It may be a local saint. I don't see him identified. Sometimes these have names. This is the typical Eastern full, as I call it, the equal opportunity resurrection. And what I must insist on Adam and Eve ain't just two people. <laughs> Adam and Eve, as you well know, of course, represent the human race. They are our ancestors in the biblical tradition. So if you want to be um, mentioned universality, here we have resurrection, and it means taking the human race. Now, let me insist again, out of Hades, not out of hell, Usually there's a figure down below those gates, very often left out in, in some images, and it shows Hades as the gatekeeper of Hades. Hades is a place, and Hades is also the person. He's a jailer. He's not a bad guy. His job is to keep everyone in <laughs> who gets in and let nobody out. So the vision is that Jesus comes in flattens poor old Hades under those two gates. You see the locks and bars are flying off in all directions. And he liberates the human race from death. Not from hell. That's what the Western does later and gets itself into all sorts of theological trouble. So these, and thank you for getting them up so early because this is the core. We have these two images. Now, what struck me with them was not, well, hey, we got a Western way of doing it, like they have Latin and an Eastern way of doing it, and they have Greek. And what's the difference? No big deal. Well, it's huge. It's huge because the Western one looks awful like just an ascension, even though, of course, it's called resurrection. So is Easter an ascension, a resurrection? And what would be the implications of that? 
And the final question I had, and was forced on me in evening lectures in the early 200s. Excuse me, Dominic, which would Jesus, excuse me, sorry, 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 which would Paul have imagined? So I had to ask myself, okay, if the Corinthians, after reading, as it were, 1 Corinthians 15, said to Paul, now you speak about the execution of Jesus, and no, we know all about that. We've seen crucifixions. You don't have to draw us a picture. But you keep talking about this resurrection thing. And that's not a word we know. Yeah, yeah, we know ascension. We understand that. That's in our tradition. You keep using this word resurrection, anastasis. Now, could you draw us a picture, Paul? Could, could you kind of just see us what the heck you're talking about? You know, we have some idea about most of the things you're talking about. Would Paul, as it were, have drawn something like the individual Western one or something like the universal Eastern one? And my answer quite clearly, and I don't think it's prejudicial, was the Eastern one because Paul is a Pharisee. And the basic, most untraditional, let me be blunt, Pharisaic belief is the general resurrection, anastasis necron. So Paul could not imagine, couldn't even use the term resurrection just for Jesus. That would make no sense. It would be like you or I if we use the word, say, the Senate or the House of Representatives, and we just went one person. So. I think, in other words, the Eastern is more in continuity and conformity with Paul's vision than the Western. And that's, of course, the thesis of the book. Mm, that's wonderful. Now, y you mentioned um, what resurrection means to various people, including Paul, a Pharisee. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. We have kind of modern connotations of what resurrection meant, but tell us that in antiquity, in the ancient world, if uh, someone hears resurrection, God raised Jesus from the dead, or he's been declared the son of God by the resurrection of the dead, not from the dead, but of the, you know, Anastasis Necron, yeah. like you said, what did that mean to Jews, including Pharisees like Paul, Essenes like yeah. the people behind the Qumran scrolls, and Sadducees like the people <laughs> Jesus is debating sometimes? What did that mean to Gentiles, especially, of course, pagan, I mean, uh, Romans and Greeks? Yeah. And then to the early Christian community who, or to an early Christian community who affirmed resurrection, who was composed of um, Gentiles and Jews. And I, yeah. I, did, I corrected myself from the early Christian community because you said there were various ways of expressing belief in the ex exaltation of Jesus and resurrection was just one of them. That's your view. But anyways, with that said, tell us what, what you think this That's meant fine. to people. That's fine. No, I said, I'm not going to pick up the term. I, I had to pick it up myself because I was using resurrection. Um, keep at the back of your mind and let's talk away that most of that first century world, if they had heard a story, let's say you heard a story about the finding of an empty tomb and visions of the person who had been in the tomb, most people open-minded, let, let me say, people are not going to say, me, that's stupid. Open-minded people would say, well, we're talking about an ascension. Whether we believe it or not, we know what's been discussed. Any Roman would know it, any Greek would know it, any Jew would know it. Put that aside now. Let's focus on this word resurrection. Here's what's going on. In most of the Old Testament, up to, I'm going to put a round date on it, around 160, 150 BCE, before Jesus, it was taken for granted that the way God ran the world, as it were, were in the Deuteronomic theology by sanctions here on this earth. You were good, you were rewarded, you were bad, you were punished. That's the way it was. That really worked and most of the whole Old Testament is written with that presumption. It really is. How do you know a good king? Well, he should live long, but oops. How about Josiah or a bad, how would you know a bad king? Well, he'd get killed fast. Oops, that didn't quite work for Manasseh. And then there was Job, but leaving that aside, the basic idea was justice was maintained by God in this world. Now, what happened 
and I think we can date it, was the Maccabean martyrs. Where was the justice of God when you were looking on the battered, tortured, executed bodies of a martyr? Don't tell me they're being punished for their sins, in other words. So by the time of Daniel, the time Daniel is written, I mean, and the time, say, of Second Maccabees, a belief began to which the Pharisees would become heir that there had to be a divine sanction process in the next life because it kind of wasn't working down here. So in one sense, they took Deuteronomy and simply moved it from this life into the next. And they said, for the justice of God, there would have to be a general resurrection that is, every single person who had ever lived would have to rise from the dead, yep, out of the seas, out of the belly of, of beasts, wherever. And they did that not for God's amusement, but for a general judgment of everyone who had ever lived. And then they would be processed, as it were, into either heaven or hell. That is the scenario. I don't think it was universally accepted, of course, but was accepted by fervent people under the strains of the post-Alexandrian world, post the world of Alexander the Great, to understand how, how can we have a just God running the world when we've, we've had Alexander's Macedonians and then we've had the Romans. There has to be the Anastasis Necron. Now, resurrection is just the shorthand for that. Resurrection, judgment, sanctions. Okay, that's the Pharisaic belief in the first century. They, they couldn't understand if you said, well, what about resurrection for one person? No, th that would be absurd. That's not what it is. That's an ascension. <laughs> they would say, don't get confused. This is about the end of time and God cleaning up the mess of an unjust world. How did Paul, who was a Pharisee, remember? He, he tells us he was a Pharisee, so he, so he believed that. Then he runs into these, I call them, very, by the way, a very careful term. I call them messianic Christiques. I don't call them Christians. They are Jews who are messianic Christiques. Messianic is simply an anglicized word for the Hebrew and Aramaic word Messiah and Christ, as you know, is simply the Greek word. So I don't call them Christians. They haven't been invented yet, as it were, as is outside Judaism, but they're Christics, they're Messianics. So in any way, Paul, Paul's conversion, and you cannot have, I do not believe, a human being having a 100% conversion I think that's called the psychotic break. <laughs> of course, Paul has a huge conversion. It's from being a non-Messianic Pharisee to being a Messianic Pharisee. But what in the name of the Lord is a Messianic Pharisee? It's somebody who says, now I'm going to quote Paul, as you, as you expect, wow. What if this general resurrection at the end of time has already begun? Wow. Well, why, why would it have already begun, Paul? I mean, you know, it's at the end of time. It's a, it's a, it's a once and for all zap, boom, bang, crash, strike of lightning. Yeah. But the world, I'm saying the world, I'm not just saying the Roman Empire, the world through the Roman Empire, has executed the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord of glory. Do you understand, says Paul, what has happened? How, how, how can God even postpone for a minute the, the justice, the injustice of that? So when you read 1 Corinthians, Paul starts off, as you well know, with this huge emphasis on the resurrection, excuse me, on the execution of Jesus. The execution of Jesus. Not just by the Roman Empire, though it is, of course, by the Roman Empire, but by the world. 
represented by the Roman Empire in his own time and place. And he ends it by saying that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have slept. The Anastasis is Necron, as you know, as he uses. So now, now we've got something that no Pharisee ever thought of, but a Messianic Pharisee has, that resurrection is, what are you saying, Paul? Is it an ongoing process like? I mean, does that mean that it's already started with Jesus? Then is heaven and hell, these are my questions, is heaven and hell going on on earth right now? Is the general judgment an ongoing process? I don't think Paul ever gets to think all of that. In, in one way, he gets away with by thinking it's all going to be over and consummated within his own lifetime. So he, he doesn't have to answer the question that you and I have to answer. Excuse me, Paul, we're 2000 years later. How is resurrected life going for you? How's the world doing under, under resurrection? <laughs> is anyone heeding it? Has anything changed? Are we, if anything, worse off now than we were in the first century? And could it be that we have let Jesus drift off into heaven instead of understanding, as you, Paul, insisted, that if we're in between the first fruits and the harvest feast, let's say, then the harvest is ongoing. It's an ongoing process. Your metaphor says that. So that's the sort of stuff we really have to be asking. How do we live within Paul's metaphor of the harvest? <laughs> because there's no such thing as first fruits and then 2000 years later come on paul you, that'll work when you're thinking fast but not for us so that's the sort of questions that came out for me from the book i don't know if they're fully even developed in the book i i can't tell you to be honest where along the last 20 years i've been clear on each step of this because it's an ongoing process of trying to think my way through it Thank you for that response, and it's delightful to hear you talk because you have so much energy and, and passion when you, when you speak, so uh, it's great. We're still continuing kind of how Paul spoke about the resurrection. Paul spoke of Jesus as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in 1 Corinthians 15. In uh, the, the evangelists, they wrote about Jesus' passion and resurrection as the fulfillment of various eschatological hopes. Resurrection itself is a key element in many Jews' expectations of the last days, including Pharisees such as Paul. In light of this, virtually all scholars agree the resurrection had immense eschatological significance in early communities. It yeah. confirmed that the new messianic age of righteousness had come and that we are to both experience God's rule and spirit now, as well as await its imminent consummation where we will be raised like Jesus. How, how much of this portrait do you agree with? I, I know you've long maintained that Jesus was an eschatological but not apocalyptic preacher, so maybe yeah. elaborate on that for us, please. Okay. All right, as you've outlined it, Noah, I would disagree with anything, but let me take those two words, because honestly, I think my fellow scholars have mystified those words beyond all human comprehension. And I'm saying this not just from writing, but, you know, I spent the first 20 years of this century lecturing in churches. And this is what I found out. Eschatologic, eschatological is, is like a blur word. It, it, the, the minds of people just blank out. At its worst, it means this is something about way off in the future, never going to happen probably, so forget it. Eschatological, the, the group <laughs> eschaton means the last, now, some recently a Harvard scholar was able to write in politics, the end of history. Oh, wow. That's, that's, what, that's what Jesus was talking about. But the question of eschatology is, is God's rule operational here and now in the world or not? If it's something eschatological in the sense of way off in the future sometime, then I'm going to say kiss and goodbye. I couldn't care less. It's like the long stretch of, of all those people who for, who for 2000 years are announcing end of the world news at 10. <laughs> and they've always been wrong. And why should I ever listen to any of them? Now the eschatological challenge, and this is out of Judaism. 
it's already present in the Torah. Any, any of the prophets would have said, if we actually live Torah and convince the world to live Torah, we will be living in the eschatological age. Because this is when God's rule rules the world. So I accept that the vision is not just, well, you know, if we all were a little bit nicer and if we all just were sweeter to one another, everything would be lovely. No, the eschatological vision, I read also as an evolutionary mandate. I really mean that. I mean, what I mean by that is if you watch what we're doing to the world on the evening news, that's where you see eschatology coming home. We are making the world uninhabitable and it's God's world. You know, God so loved the world. <laughs> Good old John's gospel that everyone knows. God so loved the world and us in it, of course, me and you in it, but not you and I first and then forget the world. God so loved the world. So eschatology is, this is my interpretation of Jesus. The challenge of Jesus is you guys have been waiting for God to do it for you. God has been waiting for you to do it with God. It's a covenantal deal, guys. What made you think God would do it for you? That there'd be a bang crash and someday God would clean up your mess? So as I understand it, eschatology is cooperation with God to clean up the mess of the world because we can't do it by ourselves because we're making it up. Now, if somebody says to me, I'm sorry, I don't believe in God, so that's all very sweet, and I couldn't care less about the Bible or Jesus or Paul. I will say, with dead seriousness, let's talk about evolution. And by evolution, I mean what everyone means by evolution. Do you think we're getting away with messing up the world? Forget God. Are there sanctions from evolution? Are there sanctions <laughs> from making the world uninhabitable? So I want to insist that the vision that I see in eschatology, I see in a totally secular world, if somebody wants to live in it, don't think that announcing the death of God frees you, it may free you from eschatology, but it doesn't free you from evolution. Evolution is doing its thing and if you think God is working behind evolution, that's fine. I'm not debating that at the moment. At the moment, I am saying that evolution is here. And no matter what you think about God, or if you don't think anything about God, <laughs> that gravity still works, you know, with or without God. So I, I want to be very careful that that's eschatology for me. Now, apocalypse. Apocalypsis is a Greek word that simply means revelation, as you know. That's why the last book in the New Testament, the book is called the Apocalypsis. Or the, uh, what's Apocalypsis about? It could be about anything, really. But in the first century, under the Romans, with empires getting bigger and bigger and bigger, despite Daniel, chapter 2 and chapter 7, <laughs> you thought the Macedonians were the worst, now you got the Romans. If anyone said, I have an apocalypsis, it was probably going to be about eschatology. It was probably going to be, soon God is going to do it. If you didn't have that message, then probably nobody was listening to your apocalypsis. But, as I understand, the message of Jesus and the message of Paul is, you're not waiting for God to do it for you. God is already here and available. And I would think for those who take the Torah and the prophets seriously, always was, by the way. <laughs> I think any prophet would say that. You guys live the ideal of Torah and God will be with you. But God won't do it for you. Nowhere does God say, I will beat your swords into plowshares and I will beat your spears in the pruning hooks. You will do it. 
I will help you. My vision will help you. My spirit within you will empower you. But oh boy, I'm not going to do it for you. So that's the way I see the difference. Jesus is absolutely eschatological. So is Paul. Now, Paul, by the way, and maybe Jesus, Paul certainly thinks this is all going to be over soon. But Paul's whole vision is not, Jesus is coming, you know, look busy. <laughs> no, the vision that Paul gives can go on. You can be wrong about the time. As if a doctor said, you know, when the COVID uh, virus arrived, oh, it'll be over in three months. Mm -hmm. No, that would have been wrong about time. But if that doctor had said, you guys should wear a mask, I think the doctor would be right about the mask, but wrong about the time. So yeah, maybe Jesus was wrong too. I'm tired of arguing that with people. Fine. If Jesus said it's all going to be over soon, he was wrong. Get over it. Everyone who said it'll be over soon up to today has been wrong for 2000 years. So I can accept that they're all wrong about the time, but they weren't wrong about the vision. That's really helpful. You, you said a lot of things there. Maybe I can try to encapsulate that. I mean, that Jesus and Paul, the, the priority for us to understand them should be that they taught the kingdom as being basically synergistic to use a somewhat modern um, theological term or you know participatory where we are participating yeah. with God now instead of waiting for God to uh, bring it about soon and without our action is, is that a fair Thank summary you. no that's perfect no you when you summarize you really do it I mean I would say one thing to help it's the way I distinguish John John the Baptist from Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. I take that especially from what their enemies, who disliked both of them equally, said. They said John fasts, and he's a nut, <laughs> a nutcase. Jesus feasts, and he's a glutton. Now, I'm leaving out the name calling, but I think they got it right, because you fast in preparation for something that's coming. God's coming to do it. You feast in celebration for something that's here. You know? so. I think Jesus is not saying God's kingdom is here, relax. I think he is saying, with all due respect to John, and he does act with all respect to John, John's wrong. John thought we're waiting for God. And that's why God didn't come. That's why God didn't come to save John. You guys have to admit that you must participate with God. And I think he, anyone who knew the Torah as a covenant should know that. I mean, it's, I mean, the covenant, if you and I make a deal, I give you this book if you give me $10. That's a covenant. That's a, you know, quid pro quo, as it were. It's a participation. It's two people. So the covenant with Israel involves God and them. The idea that God was going to do it, I'm going to be very blunt now, that apocalyptic vision is what happens to a prophet when he loses his faith. Okay, maybe that's too strong. Certainly loses his hope and definitely loses his nerve. You're no longer ready to work with God despite the Romans, despite empires getting stronger, despite everything that's going against you. You're still working with God. No, no, we give up. We're waiting for God to do it for us. Uh, 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 uh. That's great. Now, let's talk about um, your metaphorical interpretation of the resurrection. But before we do that, I just want to say that I know a number of Christians, more, more conservative Christians, have not been charitable to your metaphorical interpretation. Um, and I also know that you consistently declare that the priority for Christians should be how we act in light of, re of the resurrection, as opposed to the debate over whether or not the resurrection is literal. Learning from you and strangely from Dr. Dale Allison, whose scholarship is very different from yours, has led me to accept this priority. And I think Matthew, um, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21 to 27, also implies that oh, yeah. how, how you act on Jesus is most important, uh, more important yeah. than whether you come to him and say, Lord, Lord. So I appreciate yeah. that for sure. I don't want to attack your position, but I, 
you know, I, I still want to um, question about it since it intrigues me so and yeah. offer some respectful objections. Yeah, and I, to be honest with you, I, I don't mind people being uncharitable. I would like them to be accurate. And I would like them to have read me if they talk about me. Now, nobody has to read me at all. <laughs> it's out there. But if somebody wants to talk about my position, I do expect they have read me at least. And not just read me in the 1991 when the historic and Jesus came out. God, that's how many years ago now. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's a long time ago. So let me think about that for a while. Here's what's important for me. I, I live in a post-enlightenment world. When I'm reading pre-enlightenment people, I try to understand their world. So in the first century, for example, I, I, I've read pretty much all the contemporary texts of the first century, most of them. <laughs> Not always in the original language, but a lot of them. I visited most of the sites. I've been almost everywhere. <laughs> like that song, I've been everywhere. I visited most of the museums all over the place. Now, I'm not going to claim I could really understand the first thing. No, no, no. But I have a sense of it. And the sense is that the first century is a pre-enlightenment world, and everyone in there, more or less, accepts miracles, marvels. Not just the Jews, and not just the Christians. They do. If you read the texts, Caesar, had a, uh, Augustus had ascended into heaven before Jesus got a chance. So, yeah. So I am then forced. Sorry, I, I, if I might yeah. butt in. Sure. Um, butt in, please. Yeah. E virtually everyone agreed um, in miracles. Virtually all of the greatest ancient okay. historians in their histories or, you know, annals yeah. of, of history, they report miracles and supernatural occurrences and omens and, uh, you know, okay. all this. Yeah. But resurrection isn't um isn't a widespread belief like miracles is a widespread belief so okay. virtually all pagans agree or some agree in an afterlife a, a sort of hades kind of thing a sheol kind of thing where you're maybe wispy or you're just non-existent you die you're, you're gone at death and then yes. not even all jews believed in resurrection pharisees did okay. but sadducees didn't and so if you know maybe that's some pushback that um everyone was willing to believe in some miracle, but not everyone, maybe even most people were not willing to believe in some kind of resurrection. Okay, good. Let me take you up from there. Now, if I don't really come back, just as you say, butt in again, I, you know, it's a conversation. Yes, that's true. I think anyone could debate our ascension, but resurrection, you're right. I think you got a fair example, that's, you know, a story of, um, the acts with Paul at Athens. Everything's going fine. He mentions the word resurrection. <laughs> they just laugh at him. I mean, if they even understand it. I, 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 not, if ascension is universal, resurrection is not even Jewish. It's one sectarian group, as you just said, the Pharisees. The Sadducees dismissed it. They thought it was rubbish. They would have said, where's that in the, in the Bible? Yeah, maybe you could catch your fingernails in Daniel, but not much. I mean, they were right. The size, they could have said to the Pharisees, you guys claim to be great traditionalists, but where's that in the tradition? And of course, the Pharisees had to pull oral, oral tradition <laughs> to get out of it because no, it's not there. It's a brand new explanation, maybe 150 years old. I do not know, and nobody knows what percentage, if you took a poll, in the first century Jews would have said, we believe in the resurrection, not Jesus now, but the general resurrection. I don't know. The Pharisees did. And the Pharisees were popular with the ordinary people, but to be fair, they didn't get a very good shake from the Christics. So let's remember that. Now, I think you're right. If, if anyone in the first century said resurrection, and wasn't using it as simply a synonym for ascension, but meant it in the Pharisaic sense, most people, the vast majority of the world, would simply laugh at them. Because what you're claiming is that God has already begun, has already begun a cleanup of the world, and that's going to happen in the future. He's already begun it by, let us say, symbolically, 
raising the whole human race. Now think of that for a second. Try and think of it literally. Look at that image that you showed me earlier. Paul, excuse me, Jesus is taking Adam and Eve out of Hades. Now, if you simply look at that, and you're not going to get any image of that before around the year 700, by the way, but imagine it. How would you take that literally? How could you take that literally? God has liberated the human race from death. Okay, I actually believe that utterly. I think the vision of Jesus liberates the human race from death. And the fact that we haven't taken it seriously is why that's where the human race is slowly but steadily heading to the extinction of itself. I don't quite know how long it will take. I don't know if we'll learn fast enough to stop it, but it's absolutely meaning for me and we're in the middle of it. And it doesn't make a difference whether you believe it or not. Any more than whether you believe, <laughs> believe in global warming or not. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe in it or not. Don't believe in gravity if you, if you want, but don't jump off a 30 story building just in case. So I want to insist that there's a vision there that cannot be taken literally, but must be taken with absolute deadly seriousness as a metaphor. Hmm. That's, that's what's at stake. That's why it's not enough for me to say, well, do you accept it or not? How, how are you inside it is the question I'm asking. How are you literally inside it? And I, I know the, the answer in the New Testament is you can only do it if you have the spirit of it. <laughs> you can't do it simply by trying to imitate. You can't do it by saying, well, I like that, but I think I'll try and live like that. It's not, that's not strong enough. You have to take the spirit of resurrection <laughs> inside you. If I could use an example, supposing I, I didn't, supposing I had met Martin Luther King, I never did. And supposing I said to him, I really admire you, Martin. I would love to have your spirit. Could I have your spirit? Let's get rid of my own, you know, cowardly spirit and I'll take your spirit. And Martin said to me, yeah, but if, 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 you, if you get that, you could end up in jail. Oh, could I end up dead? Oh, yeah. Oh, and I'm backing off hard. I, could I have just maybe 5% of your spirit, just enough to be kind of decent, but not, you know, I, enough to be comfortable, not enough to be courageous. Mm. I think this, this is the way I actually see it. So it's, it's much more powerful than me was, we have to accept it. We have to say, Lord, Lord, we have to absorb the free gift. It is a free gift. It's, a, it's like a free download to your computer, <laughs> but you have to say yes, of course, even to a free download. There's no such thing as a free gift, but only a free offer. So you accept it because that's the only way that'll be, be powerful enough. And, and that's the way I see the, the, the vision itself coming. But mm. I, let me, but to be honest with you now, in case that I think it's a metaphor. No, I don't think in any way, shape or form, Adam and Eve came out of anywhere hand in hand with Jesus. Nor do I think literally Jesus, if you had been there and watching the tomb that morning, would you have seen Jesus going up alone? Neither would you have seen him coming out with Adam and Eve. I'm sorry. So every time I see a Christian saying, asking, not a dumb question, if you had a camera there on front of the tomb, could you have seen at least a light flash or something? Would you have seen Jesus coming out? I can imagine that, sure. Sure I can. I can't imagine putting a camera in front of the Eastern vision. I don't know how to do it. Where do you do it? Down in Hades? So I'm looking at these two as two powerful metaphors. And when somebody says to me, and they do, Nahoa, oh, you mean it's just a metaphor? I have to quit. Because metaphor creates reality for me. 
and I don't know what else does it. It's the way you imagine the future and decide to live it, of course. <laughs> I can imagine all sorts of futures and no intention of doing anything about them. And that's just daydreaming. But if I imagine the future and then live accordingly, for better or for worse, I will create that future. And if enough of us do it, we will create that future. And it may save us or it may destroy us. So that's that's why metaphor for me is you know, I it's far more powerful than discussions about literal or metaphorical by people who I know don't mean metaphor the same way I do. Hmm. I mean I I can definitely respect that even if um I haven't been convinced <laughs> that it's that it's metaphorical. Um no. Maybe a question could be, what reason in your eyes is there for thinking that the early Christians who affirmed resurrection interpreted their own language of anastasis metaphorically? And is uh, also, is there any yeah. Jewish precedents for, are there, are there any Jewish precedents for kind of a metaphorical resurrection? Because in my limited understanding, Jews who affirmed resurrection thought of it as a literal bodily phenomenon at the at the end of time, you know, in the, in, in the last days, um, you have an article on the Jewish context of resurrection. And you cite Second Maccabees, wherein martyrs stretch out their hands and cry out, these I got from heaven, and from him I hope to get them back. And you, you, um, you, you say that here we find a full and clear assertion of bodily resurrection, emphasized almost to the point of absurdity, but therefore all the more unavoidable. So I, I'm curious if there's any... You know, beside like uh, in contrast to this, if there's any Jewish precedents for metaphorical resurrection. No, and I I presume you're right that they are taking that literally. But but let me be very clear, I don't know that, and neither do you, hmm. because it's ext I I don't know it. I mean that I I'm not using that as a refuge. When I'm reading first century stuff, there's times I can kind of glimpse. That well, maybe ordinary people would have taken this literally, but philosophers, or maybe even the educated, wouldn't. For example, when I'm reading the opening chapters of Livy, now he's living under Augustus. Okay, he's writing history, the history of the Roman Empire. Oh, you better be very, very careful, Livy. So when he goes back to talk about Mars, he says, Well, you know, this is more poetry, but what could be worthy of the history of Rome than poetry? And then he comes down to what everyone knows that Augustus claims that uh, um, Aeneas and helped by v and Jesus, who is the father of Aeneas, whose mother is Venus, takes them and th their son all the way from doomed Troy to find the Roman race. And says the Augustan poet, the name of the son is Julius, Julius, I think, Julius, the founder of the Julian line. Now here's me, poor old Livy, I'm writing the history. I know that it's supposed to have been named Ascanius. Hmm. I don't want, I would just like not to get killed, please. And say, well, I don't think that's true. I think most people who saw the statues, the images that were all over the place of little Julius being led by the hand, for the left hand of Aeneas took it literally. I think they probably did. I don't know for sure. I really don't. But I see Livius <laughs> trying not to get in trouble by saying, well, who can tell about something which is so old? Oh, that's lovely. And he's only talking about what? Um, I don't know, maybe 700, 800 years. So I'm not using that kind of a, a refuge you know, who can talk. But I really want to say, when people read ancient texts, all of them, not just the, <laughs> not just the biblical ones. I don't know when people read the speeches, for example. Um, Agricola's great speech um, about Romans um, making a desert and calling it peace. Did they really think he, Calgacus had made that speech, but I don't know. 
So I am not going to insist that you must, any of us must, and neither will I claim if you take this literally, you're not a Christian or something like that, or you're absurd or you're stupid or anything like that. Because when we're dealing with ancient texts from pre-enlightenment texts, now there's one other thing, Nahua. I'm living in America at the moment. I find there are millions of people claiming things that I don't think happened. I don't know if they believe in them or are just using them for, you know, metaphorical purposes. I won't get into politics, but you know what I'm talking about. I don't know if I'm dealing with a pre-enlightenment mind that believes whatever it hears, whatever it reads, whatever it sees. So I don't know it. And neither does anyone else. So my solution is this. I spent a whole evening one time debating with Tom Wright, and I said, let me imagine that everything you claim about the resurrection is correct, and that the finding of the empty tomb and the vision of Jesus were all literal, just like you claim. Now, I want to debate, what's the difference if I claim it's metaphorical, in terms of life? And we bored everyone, because the rest of the evening we spent agree agreeing. Well, now, we could have spent the evening me arguing that I don't think the tomb was found empty. I think that's a mark in creation. And Tom would have argued, with very good arguments, of course, to a draw, that no, it happened. We could have spent the whole evening doing that. I am convinced that part of this process is scholars not wanting to get into trouble by saying what it really means. So let's debate one side, the other side, because we know it's going to be a draw. <laughs> if a text says this happened and you claim, well, it's a unique miracle like resurrection, and I claim something else, we know it's going to be a draw. If there's any neutral person up there, they'll probably say, well, the most it's a draw. It's maybe unique, and how, how can you argue about against a unique thing? You, you can't. If it only happened once in the world, the way we know about stuff is, generally speaking, if I claim there was no dawn, you're going to use the argument that it happened every morning, and I'm claiming one morning there was no dawn, it was night for 24 hours, you're probably not going to believe it, but your argument is going to be statistical. I can't use the statistics against it happened only once. So I would think the wisdom would be, if you take it literally, then live accordingly. If you take it metaphorically, then live accordingly. And if you want to debate, maybe you might want to ask, how come when I take it metaphorically and you take it literally, we end up with the same conclusions about how we should live? Isn't that strange? You'd think it'd be very different. I'd say, well, it's, it's a metaphor, so I don't have to really take it very seriously. It's just a metaphor. Uh, won't work. You live by metaphor. If you don't live by this one, you're living by some other one. I understand that, and I, I can respect that position. Um, I'm, you say, like, you don't know, and, and really no one knows um, kind of whether or not someone interprets something metaphorically or literally. I'm curious, what do you think would well, no, falsify it? Can, can I stop you there for a second? I'm sure. not, saying, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying that. I'm sure, honestly, there were people in the first century that took it literally, I'm sure. I mean, you know, if somebody was reading you this and you, you were illiterate, say, you'd have tremendous respect for the, the written word that you couldn't read. I'm sure there was a huge number of people who responded to the written word, which they heard orally, in the same way as many people today respond to social media or television. I saw it there, it must be true, I'm sure. But that doesn't tell me whether I live by what I would call religiously divine consistency. That I could take it for granted that God doesn't pull tricks, unique tricks. That I can find consistency. I put that in another way. 
evolution is consistent. I mean, you can figure it out and see what's happening. It's another way of putting it. So what bothers me, and this is what I'm afraid of, is that this discussion about which, now on the which side you come down on, is, is not accidentally a red herring so that we don't talk about the implications because it's only implications to get you into trouble. Jesus was, was not crucified for his, for his opinions. <laughs> he was crucified for activism. The Romans did not crucify philosophers. They really didn't. They might boot, their, <laughs> boot them out of town every now and then, but they didn't crucify them. They didn't think they were important enough. Activists, however, were something else. I don't mean violent people. I mean what we were called activists, people who were stirring up, stirring up the people in the Roman phrase, stirring up the people. So I, I think we might have worked out a marvelous way after 2000 years of avoiding implications by being very elegant, erudite scholars, not asking stupid questions. It's a, it's a perfectly honest, fair question. Do you think this should be taken literally or metaphorically? But in a pre-enlightenment world, far more was taken literally than you or I would take literally. Hmm. So I, I mean, I, I really want, I really want to insist on this. Let, let me say it once more. Augustus is up in heaven. Jesus is up in heaven. Take both literally. There's a clash. Take both metaphorically. There's a clash. So I can see the argument that you say resurrection is unique. That you're quite true. That's a Pharisaic option, but that's not the way it's been interpreted. It's been interpreted as ascension. I don't see Jesus coming out of the tomb is the way any Pharisee would have understood resurrection. They wouldn't. So even if we're talking literally now, that we talk literally just to, for the argument, if this is what we're talking about, it ain't resurrection. So I'm willing to say the Western tradition with all its emphasis on Jesus coming out alone can be called resurrection, but nobody in the first century would have understood it. I'm not talking about belief. They wouldn't even have understood what you're talking about. If you showed them that picture and said to any of them, what's that? Any of them, including the Pharisees, would have said that's an ascension. It's about Jesus being a unique person, so holy that he was taken up to God, like Moses. Um, okay, we, let's talk about the implications of kind of... Um, being a Christian and choosing to ha place faith in Jesus, if we sort of interpret his resurrection metaphorically, if if Jesus' body decayed long ago, and there is no literal afterlife in which an immaterial soul <laughs> resides now, then it seems like his lasting legacy is that he was a wonderful model of non-resistant violence to injustice. So we Christians are to live like him, but. What about the language of in in the Pauline epistles, at least, of living in Him and with Him, being reconciled through Him and transformed by Him? How do we interpret and live? How how do we interpret and experience this kind of language and live accordingly from a metaphorical position? And this is just a, a question out of genuine yeah. curiosity. No, no, it's very good. Uh, I try and answer it honestly the way I think Paul would. I think if you said, excuse me, Paul, I should live like Jesus, and Paul would say, ay, 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 you don't get it at all, do you? You can't live like Jesus unless you have the spirit of Jesus. Excuse me, Paul, what, how, how, how do I get the spirit of Jesus? He would say, your ordinary spirit is the spirit of the world. It's my term, the normalcy of civilization. You're going to have to get rid of that spirit. Huh? How, do, how do I get rid of a spirit? That's, that's me. Okay, now let me use an, an, a modern example, because this is the way I see it, this is the way I understand Paul. Imagine a heart transplant. I, I mean, a re, you know, a heart transplant today. You get rid of your old heart, 
a new heart comes in and unless it, you reject it, then you live on, okay? Uh, I would use the same thing, a new operating system to your computer, old one's gone, new one's back. I really preferred the old one, too bad, <laughs> try and get it back. Okay, Paul is operating with what I would call a spirit transplant or a spirit download. And this is what grace is. As far as he's concerned, God has this as an open gift available to anyone at any time, any place, always. But of course, you have to accept it. I can't give you a free gift. I can only give you a free offer. If you want it, you have to say, I accept. Now we have a free gift. So as far as Paul is concerned, this is grace. Grace is a free download from God, available to anyone. But Paul would say, you know, if you want to see the implications of it, take a good look at Jesus. Do you see what it cost him? This is what a free download can do to you. <laughs> this is what a heart transplant can do to you. That is why he's going to talk about in Jesus, Jesus in me. It's a, it's a mutuality. Now, I've had people say, oh, it's all mystic. No, it's not mystic. It means that your body is no longer controlled by your spirit. So you might do something very, very dangerous. You might get yourself in trouble. You might, like Paul, get yourself executed. No, I'm not talking the Christians should all go out and get executed. I really am it. But I am saying that to be a Christian is to oppose the normalcy of civilization, which has always been exactly the way it was in the first century, except now much, much, much worse. And therefore that opposition is far more needed. So of course not. It's a spirit transplant. That's the best words I can use for Paul. And that's why Paul would say, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. Now that sounds like, oh, that's lovely. People say it's mystical. But the whole point, say, of bodily resurrection is this is about our bodies. It's about our bodies in this world and this world on our bodies. It, so resurrection is about bodily stuff. It's not about all oh, our spirit will be somehow, you know. So as far as I'm concerned, I find Paul's language maybe the only adequate language for his own vision at least and I think his vision is correct it's a radical change and so when I look again come back to my eastern vision I see what well, he is he has taken up the human race out of death okay I understand that because I think that's where we're going that's not apocalyptic <laughs> that's just reading the evening news and watching the world I think we're doing a very good job now there's a vision of how we might get out of death. That's the vision of the Eastern. Not just getting Jesus out of death. The idea that Jesus got out of death and if you believe in that, you'll get out of death. I think Paul would cringe at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wouldn't, I don't contrast metaphorical with real because okay. In the Christian tradition, there are a variety of, of there's a variety of symbolism and metaphors that are established in the tradition. Uh, baptism and communion, for example, unless yeah. un unless you're a Catholic and you think that you know the communion is the is the real presence. But at least for Protestants, which is the tradition in which I am growing up, um, baptism and communion are metaphorical and symbolic. But it. I don't think a Catholic could object to that and say, oh, so you think it's just metaphorical. You think it's, it's only a metaphor. Y you'd have to give a more robust theological uh, objection at the very least. So my point is that I don't automatically contrast metaphorical with real. Yeah. But in, in these cases, the metaphor is grounded in believed historical events. So yeah. baptism is... is um, grounded in Jesus' death, you're symbolically going down and being buried yeah. with Jesus. Yeah. And communion is grounded in what's believed to be the Last Supper. So, yeah. so, but resurrection would be a metaphor that doesn't seem to be grounded 
in a literal individual occurrence at some point in history. And so that would make it um, disanalogous. That would make it importantly different in a respect. So, or, or, or do you think that the metaphor of resurrection is grounded in a historical event? Well, yes, and let me explain why. Um, first of all, I, I do think, by the way, that that, thank you for bringing that up. I think Protestants and Catholics blew the Reformation by each side going down on that. No, for a Catholic to say it's real, but not metaphorical, that's absurd. Because the realest thing in the world is a metaphor. If I take this metaphorically and operate on it from, for baptism or communion, it changes me. That's reality. And then I think Christian uh, Catholics, by coming down to this, this idea, it's real, not metaphorical, push Protestants, say, no, it's metaphorical, not real. I'm going to say with all due respect, and I'm speaking metaphorically, a plague on both your houses. <laughs> you know, really, you, you each would box one another into a corner that's absurd. Of course, when you have water poured on you and all the rest of it, of course, it's metaphorical. But the metaphorical is to change your life totally, or else you just had a bath. <laughs> and if you take the body and blood of, if you take bread and wine into your mouth and you don't unite yourself with the body and blood, human be when a human being dies, body and soul separates. When a human being is executed, body and blood separates. That's what you're committing yourself to. You're committing to a life, a life of justice, even at the risk of death. If you're not doing that, then you're having a bath in the first case and a little <laughs> sip of wine and some bread in the second. So let's get <laughs> that out of the way first. So yes, yes, there, I would say transubstantiation takes place. Of course, they, they box themselves up with theology and lost the meaning because not, none of them took metaphor seriously. They really didn't. I mean, they said they did. Anyway, now come back to what you said. I think that after the execution of Jesus, historically speaking, there were visions of Jesus. Actually, even if they said there weren't, I would have expected there should have been because it is a normal part of intense grieving whenever somebody is instantly or terribly or unexpectedly taken from you, I would expect that after 9-11, there must have been, even if we don't know it or not, I don't know this by the way, but I say there must have been people who really experienced their loved ones, who disappeared, I'm thinking especially, disappeared forever, never heard of again, never seen again, who would have experienced them as really present as much as another person right in the room. Visions are, as far as I'm concerned, a normal part of our, they're hardwired into our brains like dreams. Now the content of a vision is another question and the content of a dream is of course another question. And if you have a dream or a vision of Jesus and Jesus says to you, sell all you have, give to the poor, and you do it. All right, that's, that's something else. But so I, there were visions. I'm convinced there were. And if somebody wants to argue that they found an empty tomb, as I said to you, I don't think that's an historical event. And even if it was, it wouldn't prove anything, as you well know. Anyone could explain that in all sorts of different ways. I think Mark created that to avoid visions. I do think there were visions. Now, they have to be interpreted. What does that mean? What does a vision, our visions, our people having visions, all of which I take to be historical and valid? People have visions that can date them. Luther had visions. Augustus had visions. Paul had visions. I've never had one, but I spent my whole life with this in any case, so maybe I wouldn't have visions. But that gives them then, they have to interpret the vision. And I'm back where I started, I'm sorry. One interpretation would of course have been, and the easiest one, and I suspect 
the immediate one, ascension. Mm. Jesus is with God, and therefore you could conclude we should obey him, we should do what Jesus said, we should anything you want to draw. That's theology, that's up to you. Or you could say, well, he's coming back soon. Well, what's he doing? But that's one. Now, the extraordinary thing is, and I don't think it was there before Paul. Because I can't find it securely before Paul. Paul said, no, it's not an ascension, it's a resurrection. And, and all with that. The resurrection, for example, is nowhere in the, in the, the document that the scholars call Q, the source used by Matthew and Luke, besides Mark. It's not there. There's nothing but execution and resurrection there. I can't find it before Paul. I can find, for example, in Mark chapter 9, a perfect, perfect example of an ascension. We call it the transfiguration. Even have Mo, uh, Moses and Elijah who are already ascended into heaven, in Jewish tradition, ready to meet Jesus. And then coming down from the mountain, the, the mountain you have an ascension, coming down, Mark says, don't tell anyone until the resurrection, until Jesus is risen. That's Mark turning ascension into resurrection. So I think that yes, there were visions. That's the historical, I don't know if you wanted to say grounding or whatever term you want to use, but whatever, that required interpretation. Mm. And it did require interpretation. And those were back now where we started. All right, that's, that's great. Um, we, we've covered a lot. And while I often want to just, you know, butt in or, or say something, I, I think Sorry. we can move on to, no, 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 it's totally fine. It, it's wonderful. Um, I want to talk about something that's really intriguing, and I don't know if you coined the term, but a prophecy historicized. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, so prophecy historicized. Yeah. People can go through your work. You talk about it all the time, I think most extensively in your book, The Birth of Christianity. Um, yeah. And you go over how, especially in the passion narratives, um, it's not that history kind of, it's not that history occurred and then people interpreted it, interpreted it through the lens of scripture. It's that early Christians searched the old, searched the Jewish Bible. They searched their own scriptures, and then constructed and crafted a passion narrative through that, with with maybe historical nuggets. But it's primary. You you kind of give a rough estimate of like eighty percent um, versus twenty percent history. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, which I know is is very rough, but. I'm curious if you could give, if there are any examples of prophecy historicized in the resurrection accounts. Are there? I don't think so. I, I'd have to think about it. No, because Paul says, according to the scriptures, you know, um, 1 Corinthians 15, that he would he died according to the scriptures. Well, it's, I guess you might be able to get the prophecies for that. And he rose again according to the scriptures, a lovely parallelism. And then you say, okay, I've, the first half of that, I've, I, I could come up with dozens. <laughs> In fact, the whole history of the Jewish people being tortured and executed, but <laughs> could be, you know, incarnated as it were, embodied in Jesus. When all of a sudden I've got, he's going to rise after three days, according to the scriptures. Oh dear, I'm, I'm not big on, how that happened, especially the three days. I mean, maybe you can find something, but nothing compared to the execution one. So I don't know if, if, if we have histo prophecy historicized, because I don't think there's anything about resurrection anywhere in the New Testament before you get to that tiny thing in Daniel. And second, second Maccabees is not in the Jewish Old Testament, of course. So no, I, I, I don't see it really, according to the scriptures. I, he, I don't know quite what he's seeing. And I, I, I the, part of the, one of the big difficulties is whether, uh, is that Paul, is that pure Paul? And then when he gets into the apparitions, he's getting, you know, what he's, what he's learned, of course, from Peter and everyone else. Did he learn that little couplet <laughs> from Peter? Or is that his own messianic, um, pharisaic interpretation that 
death and resurrection go together and in the pharisaic tradition that that's what he's talking about that he would rise because in the pharisaic tradition the resurrection of the dead comes, comes so i i don't know i i don't know whether that's his his summary of pharisaism but i don't i don't see the examples what do you think of the possibility that this he was raised um in three days according to the scripture and, and co- according to the scriptures that results from a sort of midrashic interpretation so for our audience at least in my understanding and you can correct me um midrash was a um it's it's a form of jewish interpretation where they take a little verse or passage throughout the the old testament and they combine it to create some theological truth or some doctrine a lot of the beliefs about the messiah come from midrash they'll take a little thing from isaiah a little thing that might be like foreshadowing and so maybe when early christians said and believed and even when the risen jesus in the gospels says you know to the emmaus disciples he he opened their eyes to the scriptures um, when he often says that the scriptures say the Son of Man must die and after three days rise, he's taking a little thing from maybe Genesis where, you know, with um, with Abraham and his son Isaac and the, a three-day trip and, um, you know, how that's kind of viewed as a foreshadowing of Jesus in Hebrews and even in Irenaeus. He's taking something from Hosea, which talks about you will rise in three days. He takes a little bit from Daniel and Isaiah, maybe the suffering servant, maybe um, the Son of Man and Daniel who after a time and a time and a, like a half a time or something, two and a half, you know, okay, times he comes half. back and he's restored. Like a little bit of Midrash everywhere to come to a, a doctrine, like scriptural searching in Midrashic style to come to the conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead. That's a very tentative suggestion, but I'm curious uh, what you think of that. Um, I have no problems at all with it as early Christian exegesis at all but whether it comes from jesus <laughs> i mean and emmaus emmaus is one of the most magnificent examples of a not a midrashic but a metaphorical story of course G- jesus explains the scriptures and it warms people's hearts but it's when they take in the stranger into their house and eat with them that jesus appears and then he's gone that is about as metaphorical a resurrection account and is major evidence that they could think metaphorically not of, not always but at least that one example i don't know if luke takes it literally i suspect he does luke takes a heck of a lot literally luke thinks that the resurrected jesus could eat could eat i think paul would be screaming i think that is a scream when he's flesh and blood uh, uh, body and blood does not hurt the kingdom of heaven or something yeah, I, I think I, I think that's good evidence that Luke can create a metaphor. So is the story of Legion and Mark. But um, I have no problem with all of that any more than I have with them constructing their whole execution scene. And it's profoundly theological because it means that all the sufferings of the Jewish people have been sort of embodied in Jesus. He doesn't just die as one suffering servant <laughs> he dies as the incarnation of the suffering of his people i mean that's right. a sublime understanding of, of the uh, and therefore to be honest with you when i read all this what i call prophecy historicized in the account of the crucifixion of jesus i am all set for finding it in the resurrection of jesus and therefore i'm not ready to find jesus with or without scripture doing it alone if I find him raising the whole human race, well, that's even better in a resurrection than an execution which incarnates the whole Jewish people's suffering and maybe the suffering of all peoples because of the Psalms are prayers that anyone can pray, really, who has ever suffered. In, in many cases, there's nothing particularly Jewish about them except the invocation maybe of God, you might say, but somebody who cries out in pain in the Psalms doesn't have to be a Jew. So the Psalms could be the prayers of all, the pain of all the world. And then that gets me ready for the resurrection is the salvation of the whole human race, liberation from death. So I would find that would go together quite well for me. 
um, Dr. Mark Goodacre argues against history remembered and against prophecy historicized. He, he goes against the view that it was just plain rem- remembering of historical details, rec- you know, historical recollection. And he also goes against that virtually all of the passion narrative was constructed from the scriptures. He says there was a, a back and forth, like an interplay. Um, there were, the, when we read the passion narratives, we still see a lot of, of history. And, and he kind of um, says that even if you get rid of, even if you get rid of all the verses that you, Dr. Crossan, would kind of say, these are based in scripture, like they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, which, you know, is, you, you would say it's constructed from Psalm 69, verse 22, um, or dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see, yeah. like Psalm 22. If you got, got rid of all that, you would still have a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, passing by on his way to the country, uh, fr- way in from the country, and, you know, he was forced to carry the cross. You'd still get Jesus going to the place of Golgotha. Um, you would have his crucifixion, of course. You would have it be the third hour. You would have the uh, titulus, I think, the, the king of the Jews. And so this is more than just a bare-bones summary like what you would see in Josephus or Tacitus. There's, it's still very specific, and Dr. Goodacre views this as evidence that there is a lot of history, but of course it is. It, 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 there was history, then it was interpreted through the lens of Scripture, and then that was kind of how it was expressed, where it's both balanced. I don't know if I'm doing the best job or a superlative job of explaining it, but I think hopefully you can see what I'm saying, and, and Dr. Dale Allison in chapter five of Constructing Jesus, he kind of cites him approvingly. I'm, I'm curious if you've ever heard this suggestion. It's basically like a balance between your view and maybe something like Dr. Raymond Brown's view. Um, if you have heard it and if you have, or if this is the first time, what you think of that? Um, I don't want to even bother arguing with it, to be honest with you. Sure. I mean, I loved arguing with Ray Brown because his position was clear. I would find arguing with that would be like being battered to death with ping pong balls. You know, I mean, it's neither one thing nor the other. I mean, I would prefer somebody to say the whole thing happened there. The, 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 the story was kept, but the women watched and they saw them dividing the clothes and, the, the, you know, the whole thing happened that way and God was engineering it so everything happened according to the Psalms. At least that's kind of a, you know, it's the sort of things I think we scholars do to keep ourselves busy. And I'm just not interested in it, in it anymore. Mm. You know, well, I perhaps think, that's just I my... Think, well, well, no, I mean, it's, I mean, it's neither one thing nor the other. I think what we have to face, and this is the real question, did we have, well, let me back up. Mark is the source for Matthew and Luke. Therefore, if we only had those three, we would only have the story of the execution as in Mark. Now we have to decide about John. I think, I think John has an independent tradition, but he knows only the execution story from the synoptics and his function is to put Jesus in charge of his own execution, which he does magnificently. I think we have only one tradition derived from Mark of the execution of Jesus. That's my position. We don't have it in Q. We don't have it anywhere else that I know of before those sources. Therefore, are we dealing with Mark, focusing on Mark for the moment, with a report of something that happened, that basically somebody was watching the execution and they could tell me about it. I, I, there's nothing impossible about that. Somebody could be, as it were, saying this happened, this happened, that happened. It's possible, but then you have to say, and the whole thing was programmed by God to agree with the scriptures or programmed by Jesus, as in John's gospel, as it were. <laughs> John's gospel has Jesus programming the whole thing. And when he's, when he's finished, he says, okay, it's over now. I'm off. I'm out of here. Jesus is programming his own execution. 
I don't believe that for a second. And I think it is a, I'm sorry to be, to be very blunt with you, a vacuous position. It's a far more profound position that the earliest Christians looking at the sufferings of Jesus and looking at the sufferings of their own people incarnated, embodied all that suffering with Jesus. So he died as the embodiment of the sufferings of their people. Maybe I'm prejudiced, but I find that much, much more profound than this idea that maybe this happened, maybe that happened. And I, I, that's fuzzy. I, I can't even know how to discuss it because it's, it's, it's like cotton wool. It disappears when I try to hold on to it. So I, I really would much prefer and loved writing a book against Ray Brown because he was so clear. I knew exactly what his position was, but I wouldn't know how to even argue this. And I apologize to Dr. Mark Goodacre if I've kind of fuzzied up his, okay. um, you know, his view. Uh, we can take that as no, an it's objection probably against. Me. That's probably me. It's probably me. It's probably me. Um, but I did. I did. You know. Remember, I spent a summer writing "Who Killed Jesus" in response to Ray Brown. And it was magnificently easy because Ray gave you all the arguments for something. So you didn't have to do any research. He told you all the arguments for something. Then at the end, he said, but it could be this. And sure it could. It can always be something else. But he'd give you all the arguments why it should be this. So when I read through all of it, and including maybe this is a direct quotation, I thought it was really more obvious that the people were trying to do this. But, you know, if I had, if I had four, if I had even three independent witnesses, and I'm taking it for granted that you agree with this, by the way, stop me if I'm wrong, that Matthew and Luke are copying from Mark. So we don't have three witnesses to the crucifixion, but one and two, two plagiarists. Then I would be perfectly happy to say, well, we must have a record of it because we have it in Mark. We have it pretty similar in Matthew with some changes, pretty similar again in Luke with some changes, and John maybe a fourth one. So we have four witnesses to the execution, and they're pretty much the same with, you know, allowable changes. So yeah, this must be what happened. And however you explain it, it came out exactly according to the scriptures. I, I, if I had four, I'd have no choice. I have four independent witnesses. I don't know if all your audience knows there's a consensus of scholarship that Mark is the source for Matthew and Luke. Ray Brown would agree with that, by the way. He would not agree that John is independent. So he has two vectors on the execution. I have nothing against that. If I believed as a scholar that John was totally independent, I would say so and be perfectly happy to figure that wherever they agreed, I have something to, to build on. But I don't. And what we really have to explain is why, before we get to Mark, we can't get a history of what happened. It ain't in Paul, except he was executed, of course. I mean, it ain't in the Gospel according to Q. How come for almost 40 years, nobody set down the story of the execution of Jesus. This happened, that happened, this happened. Until you get to Mark. And then it's all perfect, as you said, it's according to the hours. So it, I don't find it the most important thing, to be honest with you, but I think my own opinion is a more profound theology. I'll, I'm willing to say that. That doesn't make it right but it does make it, I find, more interesting. All right, thank you for that. There's, again, a lot I'd say, but we're, we're approaching an hour and 40 minutes, so let me okay. ask a, a final major question. Um, okay. Okay, what do you think, I'll just be, it'll be blunt, what do you think occurred historically from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross through the Easter visions and the development of various communities and literature? I, that, that is to say, if you were okay. there, recording everything with the camera, what would you have seen? Okay, okay here's the best I can do. And I, I, I'm watching time. 
I think Jesus was invited to come up to Jerusalem, invited by his followers in Jerusalem, who probably said something like, if you're serious about this God's rule movement, take it out of the hick towns of Galilee, come up to the capital, and we run a double demonstration against Roman occupation and high priestly collaboration. Now, that's, I think, what happened. That's why he went up this time and something happened that if he went up before, never happened. Or if he hadn't gone up often before, then why he went up this time? He went up to witness to God's rule on earth. They said to him, I think, we can protect you. You have enough followers here who will protect you during the day in the temple. They want to get you, of course. We know that. We can protect you. And every night, get out of the city, out of the, the city to Bethany. You'll be safe by day, you'll be safe by night. You won't get killed. He doesn't go up, as I see it, to get himself killed, either as a model of vicarious atonement or as a model of extreme suffering, Protestant or Catholic. But he, he goes up knowing he could get killed, of course. He knows what happened to John the Baptist. He knows the danger. But it's, if you're serious about God's movement, it ain't for Galilee. It's for Jerusalem and all the pilgrims that will take it out. Now, what happens? You can read it in Mark's gospel, even though I don't think that every day. Mark keeps repeating every night he goes out to Bethany. Right. Every day, the authorities want to kill him. The authorities want to kill him. The authorities want to arrest him. They can't because of the crowd. They can't because of the crowd. Then, I don't need John. The ba I don't need um, Judas the traitor. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But if I'm Caiaphas, I figured out what's happening. Every Every night he gets out of the city. It takes me about till Thursday night. <laughs> Let's using our, our accounting. He comes in on Palm Sunday in our accounting. Demonstration on Palm Sunday against Rome. Demonstration on uh, what we call Easter Monday against the high priestly authority in the temple. Makes his demonstration, gets away with it. Why isn't he dead by our Palm Sunday? Because the crowd's protecting him. There's a danger of a riot. And that's the most volatile thing at Passover, as we know. So. Caiaphas knows by, say, Thursday night exactly where to get him. In the dark, halfway between Jerusalem and, um, what do you call it, um, Bethany. Garden of Gethsemane is exactly where the roads go around either the north or the south of the, the hill. The, so that's where we get him. We get him there and we get him crucified before anyone knows anything about it. We take him to Pilate and Pilate is knowing the volatile danger of anything at Passover, will be quite willing. We tell him, he says, King of the Jews, and if he's, if he's talking about King of the, uh, the Kingdom of God, maybe, if he's talking about the Kingdom of God, he thinks he's the King, that Pilate buys that, Pilate executes him. Or as Josephus sums it up, the first man among us handed him over to Pilate. That's exactly what happened. Now, I don't know whether that is simply a good scenario that Mark made up because he knows a good story, but it makes absolute sense why Jesus gets away with a demonstration on Sunday, using our language now, and on Monday, and isn't executed immediately. Because the crowd is on his side and he gets out of the city at night. Everything I read in that story tells me Jesus goes up expecting, knowing the danger of being executed, but expecting to get away with it. And he almost does get away with it. That's my scenario. And then from, from his death to the um, kind of the Easter visions, which you, you, you have a chapter in your book called, okay, yes, you know, yes. how, like how many years was Easter Sunday? So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. The other question is, so that's, that's the execution. Now, what about the burial? Here's the problem for me. How secure am I of the burial? Here's, here's the problem for me, working backwards. If I begin with John, I find an absolutely fabulous burial. As Ray Brown said, the whole tomb is filled <laughs> with the ointment. <laughs> There's hardly enough room for the body. It's, it's not the burial of a king, it's the burial of a god. It's almost like John saying, how would you burial, how would you bury Jesus, son of God? Magnificently. Now, I back up into Matthew and Luke. 
I don't find them doing anything except fixing up Mar. I don't think they have any independent tradition. They just want to make the tomb a little better. So I get back to Mark, a hurried burial by a pious Jew like Tobit, for example, who doesn't want to leave the body there. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. Uh, could he bribe somebody, or with or without permission from Pilate, could he bribe the guards to get the body? Of course he could. Is it possible that there was a hurried burial by a pious Jew? Of course it's possible. Do I think it happened? No. I think that's hope. It's not history. Because I don't think the Romans, the Roman power, would have allowed it. Now, if somebody argues whether they could have bribed the guards and the guards would have allowed them to take down the body, it's absolutely possible. If I had a consistent burial, then I might, I might take it. But I think it's an act of hope. I don't think they knew what happened to the body of Jesus. I think the hope is surely some pious Jew would have done it, because we, we know we didn't do it, but some pious Jew would have buried the body. And then Matthew and Luke, as I said, did it in his own tomb, and John eventually is in the garden tomb. I don't find plausibility of a tradition in the burial tradition. I think it's grounded, as I said, in hope rather than in event, if I could put it that way. And I understand it. I would think any loved ones whose, whose beloved person has dis disappeared, as it were, into the maw of power would want to say, surely, surely, surely. So that, now, I think what happened, and I would expect it to happen, is visions. And the more I think that Jesus, as it were, disappeared into what I call the maw of power, not wanting to turn him into any kind of a martyred site. I think that makes more and more sense to me that visions were almost absolutely predictable. And if you want to say that women were more likely to have visions of beloved ones than men, that's the statistics. <laughs> that's what any psychiatrist will tell you in, in a situation like this. So now we have visions. And we're back, of course, to the beginning, as I said. Now we need to interpret visions. And there's two models, two metaphors. I think this is about the end. I, I really appreciate this. <laughs> um, you know, I, I again, I'm honored to have you on. You're such a great scholar. Do you have any final thoughts for me, for the audience, just anything you want to share? Well, I have one final thought to the audience about you. You are a brilliant interviewer. Yeah. Thank you. No, let's, let's be very clear. You did your homework very carefully and very honestly, openly. And it was an absolute pleasure talking to you for two hours. And I talked to an awful lot of interviewers and I'm not saying anything against anyone but I'm saying you're as brilliant as I've been interviewed by. And I want to thank you very much, Nahoa, for that. You're welcome. And again, thank you so much. Um, well, to our audience, to you, Dr. John, John Dominic Crossan, peace. Peace. And peace to you and to all of us. <laughs>